So good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here. Uh, uh, I know it's raining a little bit this morning. It got a little wet, but it looks like it will be all day long. Anyway, so the first, the first lecture for us this morning is about neutron reflectometry. Okay, so just some general statements to begin with. And the first is that a lot of what we talk about this morning for neutrons applies equally well to x-rays. And you've already heard by now, after your week at Argonne and time here now, that really the basic difference is just what the interaction potentials are, the x-rays and the electrons and the neutrons and the nuclei. However, we'll see in the second uh, discussion we have this morning that neutrons also couple very strongly to atomic magnetic moments, to the unpaired electrons in a unit cell of some material. But other than that, a lot of what we say can be applied either for neutrons or x-rays, given the different potentials for scattering. OK, so a lot of what we study with neutrons, I mean, all of us are here to learn about the microscopic, or at least the nanoscopic, structure of materials. And one of the really well-established probes is neutron scattering. So it's not a direct space probe, as you all very well know. It's not like electron microscopy, where what you see is what you get. What's there is what you see. But when we do x-ray or neutron diffraction, we have to interpret diffraction patterns to back out, to infer what the structure of that material was to give us the diffraction pattern that we observed. OK. so. Uh, Lots of neutron instruments and x-ray instruments, too, are specialized for different types of scattering problems. So for this particular, what we're going to talk about in this first discussion is what happens when you try to scatter from thin film structures, very thin material, uh, condensed matter, either soft or hard condensed matter, that's in a very lamellar or lamellar thin uh, morphology. OK, so there are specialized instruments for that. And these are called reflectometers. And basically, the truth be told, they're just diffractometers. But they're focused on doing the instruments more efficiently at very low scattering angles, as we'll try to see. OK? It also means that to, to use this particular specialized diffraction technique, you need to prepare samples that are appropriate for this kind of measurement. So uh, in this first discussion this morning, uh, there, I've divided it into three parts. First part, just talk about some of the basic ideas and concepts involved in the reflection. Because as it turns out, it is a little bit different than, for example, doing x-ray diffraction or neutron diffraction at higher momentum transfers, at higher angles. Uh, and then in the second part, we'll try to look at some of the applications of specular neutron reflectometry to different types of films. In this first discussion, it will be mostly about soft condensed matter. Uh, we will, there are many, many applications for neutron reflectometry from magnetic thin films. But we'll talk about that. It's just convenient to do that in the second talk this morning. Okay. And then in the third part, it's kind of sort of for your general knowledge, is associated with all scattering. It's a, it, we, we take advantage of the wave nature of the photon or the neutron. And we have to interpret the wave function squared. It's a probability density. So because we're using that radiation as kind of a ruler to measure the positions of different constituents in the scattering material, when we square that wave function, we lose all, wave, all phase information. Because the wave function is a complex quantity. If you take the, that quantity times its complex conjugate to get the probability, you lose the phase information. It cancels out. So this is a huge problem. And it always has been in diffraction. But it turns out that in neutron reflectometry, there's a way to see how to get around that by using interferometric techniques. So it's just of general use and interest. Maybe you'll never use it in your whole lives or careers, but at least we can talk about it a little bit. OK, and then there are some appendices. And if we have time, we'll go look at a few of those topics. 
So there's a lot more information that we could possibly cover or that you'll probably ever want to know about or look at. But if you do, it's there. And you can always email me too if I confuse you this morning. You can email me and I'll continue to confuse you even more. But please do so. People actually have emailed me in, in the past and, and this has actually worked out pretty well. Okay, so let's begin. And so to start out, we're going to first talk about some of these general concepts. There's a picture on here of uh, uh, alpha hemolysin uh, channel for uh, different biological molecules to traverse the membrane around all of the cells. And neutron reflectometry has found a lot of application in determining a lot of the nanoscale structure of these uh, transmembrane proteins or pores. And we'll have a couple of examples through the presentation. Okay, so for neutron reflectometry, again, uh, we can study the chemical uh, properties in the material we're interested in, and with polarized neutrons, the magnetization properties. Uh, we can take advantage, as you've heard many times over and over, the isotropic contest, uh, contrast possible, especially by hydrogen deuterium substitution. The probe is non-destructive. It goes through large quantities of macroscop macroscopic distances of surrounding environmental materials, cryostats, pressure cells, whatever. Uh, what's different about reflectometry is that you may have heard that neutrons and x-rays, when they scatter from materials, they're very weakly interacting probes. So it makes the analysis of the scattering relatively easily compared to, for example, electron diffraction, where the electron interacts really strongly with the material. However, a little bit paradoxically, at very low momentum transfers at low Q, the scattering is so strong for neutrons and x-rays that below some particular critical angle of incidence, every single neutron and photon are, are reflected. So it's extremely strongly interacting in that particular geometry. And we have to change a little bit the scattering theory about how we deal with that situation at the very lowest of Qs. So we'll see something about that. Okay. And neutron reflectometry as well as x-ray reflectometry are really now well-established probes for studying condensed matter, both soft and hard matter. Again, most of you here, I think, would be interested in possibly considering neutrons or x-rays as tools, research tools, as probes for in your careers and your study of different kinds of materials. So it's one tool in the toolbox. And this is not a panacea, it doesn't answer all the questions, but combined with other techniques, it compl helps complete the picture of what materials look like. So just think of this as a possible tool that you may use in the future. Okay, and I already mentioned some of what's in here. Uh, this scattering problem, it turns out, by using interferometric techniques, actually makes neutron reflectometry almost like direct imaging by collecting the right type of diffraction or uh, scattering information, you can in fact get out a unique solution for what the object material density distribution was that gave rise to that scattering. It's almost like taking a picture. Okay, last, uh, uh, piece of general information. It's extremely important in whatever you do in neutron reflectometry or for scattering for that matter in general, that the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, really applies. Unless the effort is made to prepare the sample properly for the probe that you're using to study it with, you're, you're not gonna get anywhere. So, most of the effort these days, all of these wonderful scattering devices exist at Oak Ridge, at NIST, and other places around the world. But unless the samples are prepared correctly so that you can do this reductionist approach that scientists use to study things, like if you're gonna study some lipid membrane from a cell wall with a particular protein in it, you don't wanna have a sample that has lots of other junk in it that also give rise to scattering. So a lot of effort has to go into making the sample 
to be exactly what it is that you want to study. Say it's that particular protein, transmembrane protein I showed you a, a picture of a few slides back. You want to make sure your sample contains that and only that, and you don't get confused by having something else in there. Because again, when you do diffraction, you're looking at the whole volume, whole area, and for all practical purposes of the sample that you put in the beam, okay? So you can talk to electron microscopists too. They spend a great deal of time preparing their specimens, even especially with the cryo-EM techniques that are used now. So the first thing we're gonna talk about and what we'll focus on today is what's called specular reflection. And what we mean by specular is just this, that if I think of a ray as giving us the direction of the incident uh, neutron relative to some flat surface where here is the normal, if I maintain the detector such that the detector sits to receive the reflected neutron at the same angle as the incident neutron came in at, then that's called the specular condition. And that means that what we call the wave vector transfer, the difference between the vector difference between Ki and Kf is normal to the surface. And this has a lot of important implications. So what it means is if we maintain this geometry, and let's say this is the film structure, I've rotated the things 90 degrees, so the beam comes in like this and out like that. But if the sample is normal, perpendicular to this layered film-like structure on some big macroscopic substrate, which is as flat as possibly can be made, then when we do the scattering under the specular condition, what we're actually doing is getting information along the surface normal. We're, pro we're doing a depth profile. It's like an archeological dig into the strata to see what the composition is as a function of depth. But when we do that, the momentum is conserved, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, along the in-plane directions, if this is x and y and z is the normal, and what we get in that scattering process, if you work through the mathematics of it, you find that what you're getting is a profile, a depth profile, which is in fact the average scattering density in plane. So if you think of this as slices of bread, then what you do is you get the average scattering density for some slice of thickness delta z and average it, so pictorially in color, uh, red and blue make purple, and yellow and blue make green, and red and yellow make orange, and so on, but you get the picture, I think. You get the average scattering density plotted as a function of depth at these different positions, see, okay? So here's another slide that sort of reinforces that idea, gives you the whole picture. So again, if we measure as a function of angle, so we start out at smaller angles, go higher, 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 maintaining the specular condition, the reflectivity as a function of this wave vector transfer, measured as a function of Q, which is proportional to the angle because Q is equal to four pi over lambda times the sine of the angle. If we measure this information, the scattered information, what we get out is the depth profile. So you can see here where these head groups of this uh, uh, bilayer system, lipid bilayer, uh, you can see that you get where the head groups are, what's in between, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's, that's the thing that we're gonna focus on today, that kind of scattering. And here's a, a picture that shows you, for example, if you had spheres lying on the surface, the average profile that you would get is some parabolic shape like this. If they were cylinders, it would be, again, parabolic-like, but a little bit broader. And if it was lamellar, you get a more rectangular profile. Okay, so how does this all come about? Well, a more modern view of quantum mechanics is that a neutron and photon, they're quantum objects on a microscopic scale. But quantum objects, meaning that they really are particles in a sense, but they have associated with them a wave function and that wave function has the information about its wave-like, about those uh, particles' wave-like character. And they dictate what the wave function is, dictates how that particle, the neutron or the photon, interact with the material. 
So the wave function is function sort of, if you like to think of it this way, rides along with that quantum object, that neutron or that photon, and it's a book of instructions of how it can interact with a particular material, okay? But the neutron starts out at a reactor as a constituent of the nucleus in uranium-235, and it gets fissioned and then moderated, comes in and reflects from a sample and gets detected. And when it gets detected, it gets captured, let's say, by a helium-3 nucleus and again becomes part of a nuclei, an alpha particle. So from beginning to end, it's a particle, but in between, its scattering is determined by its wave-like characteristics that are described entirely by its wave function, okay? So if we're gonna talk about what happens when that neutron or photon scatters from the sample, we have to treat it as a wave. And to start out with the simplest possible description, people usually describe the neutron or the photon as a plane wave. So it's this exponential form, but if you like, you can just write it as a cosine and a sine, a real and imaginary part, and it oscillates in space and time. And knowing this, we can mathematically describe how this interaction with material uh, occurs. So without going into too much of the detail, we just want to say that quantum mechanically, analyzing the property of the wave function that represents how the neutron or photon interacts with the material, it's just a conservation of energy. The kinetic energy and the potential energy must be equal to the total energy at all times and all places. So if we go through the quantum mechanics, it turns out that for neutron scattering at low Q, the potential really looks like a number density multiplied for each constituent atom with its corresponding nucleus, a number of atoms per unit volume times a characteristic scattering length. So for nickel, it's one number. For iron, it's another. For hydrogen, for carbon, it's different numbers. You multiply this by the density and these proper constants to make it the right units of a potential of an energy, then you get a scattering length density. So at low energy transfers, we have nanometer scale resolution. We don't see the distances between atoms, but we see something on a half nanometer scale. So we can treat the material almost all material as a continuous media, just like you do for light optics. And so, just like for light optics, we can describe the potential as a refractive index. So we can think of this refractive index as one, the square of it as one minus some constant times the scattering length density. So everything we talk about, all materials we're interested in, we first describe them, their potential for scattering as a refractive index. Again, just like you would do in classical light optics. Okay, but to make a long story short, remember for the specular condition, we said that all of the momentum transfer is normal to the plane of the film, so perpendicular to the stage, like if I'm the normal to the stage. All of the information is a function of depth, and so any information in the xy plane, because there is nothing to scatter neutrons from the homogeneous potential, along in plane, we have basically a one-dimensional problem. So we can disregard the X and Y in plane components unless there are really big differences in the, in the density distribution in plane, and then we have to look at the non-specular scattering, and that can be done in a different experiment where you actually have the momentum transfer tilted off the normal, so a component of the transfer lies in the plane, and then we can study those properties. But it's the same principle, and we're not gonna spend time on that today because most of what people do, 95% of what's done is on thin film systems is in the specular. But non-specular is done, and there's a little discussion of that in one of the appendices. But anyway, to make a long story short, if I think about the wave coming in, the wave reflected, the wave transmitted, if you work through all of the mathematics of solving that uh, one-dimensional problem, you get a relationship between the reflected amplitude, this is the wave function itself, not the square yet, and it looks like this integral relationship where you have the scattered uh, wave function, this represents the incident wave function, this represents the scattering length which is 
contained in that refractive index description of the potential. So in most scattering, it turns out that the scattering is so weak that we can replace that scattered, or that wave function, sorry, this is the wave function within the material. This is the scattered wave function. The wave function in the material is so slightly distorted that we can replace it with the same form as the incident plane wave function. And that leads to this really important relationship that the reflection amplitude is related to the Fourier transform of that scattering density distribution. In this case, one dimensional, because we're just talking about the specular, okay? So here it is, and this is the basic, this is through the Born approximate, so-called Born approximation. And for crystallography, almost all elastic scattering, this is the relationship you use. Now this is really important to know because it says that what we measure in scattering space by measuring the reflection as a function of Q, we're actually relating that to the density distribution by a Fourier transform. So what's localized in one place, you know, R at 1Q or rho at 1Z, in the other space, it's related to the whole sum of all the scattering. So all of the scattering contributes to the information we get about one location in space, okay? So this is the thing that's really difficult to deal with and why we have to do a mathematical analysis to get the structure out. Okay, now after having said that, it's, this is nice to keep in mind because it's really important in general, but for reflectometry, I said at the beginning that it fails at very low Q. So in this plot, here's a, it's just a model scattering length density profile. This is normal to the surface, and this is the profile of density as you go as a function of depth. If you look at the reflected neutron intensity, the exact solution, as, it, as we'll see, looks like this, but that Born approximation, that Fourier transform relationship, looks like this. And at higher wave vector transfers, as we get out to higher and higher angles, it's a perfect match almost. But down in here, it orders, it differs, this is a log plot, by more than an order of magnitude in places. So it totally fails. If you try to analyze neutron or X-ray reflectometry data with the Born approximation, you will guarantee, you will be guaranteed to get the wrong answer if the material, unless the material is extremely thin or very weak, scattering uh, potential. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Well, the way to deal with it is to go back to first principles and solve the exact Schrodinger equation without the approximation that the wave within the material is not distorted. So this is the totally distorted solution that happens to be exactly correct. And it turns out because, and only because it's a one-dimensional problem now, this can be solved actually rather, rather straightforwardly. So we have a one-dimensional wave equation and the way that you solve it is a piecewise continuous fashion by just stating that the continu that it has to be continuity of the wave function, which means particle conservation, and its first derivative, which means momentum conservation. And if you require this to happen, you can relate the transmission amplitude to the reflected amplitude and the incident amplitude via a set of constants the so-called transfer matrix that contains all the information there is about the scattering potential. So for one slab, it's four numbers. This is very easy to do for just a block of scattering potential. But suppose you have some arbitrary scattering length density depth profile and you want to know what that is. Well, you can take anything and break it in it, like finite element analysis and engineering, you can break this potential into thin slices where you assume that across that slice, that thin slice of delta Z, the scattering amplitude is constant. And in the limit that you make these delta Zs so thin, it becomes an exact solution. But it turns out this, the linear algebra of it all is such that the total transfer matrix, this ABCD that relates, sorry, that relates the transmission and reflection amplitudes to one another. This is a product of all of the individual slices that you break the potential into. So by this analysis, you can uh, uh, study any arbitrary depth profile and solve that equation. 
And again, these constants in the transfer matrix contain the phase shifts, which contain information about the potential through this refractive index. So it's all there, just so you know. Okay, what, is re what do reflectivity profiles look like for you know, typical types of uh, samples? Suppose you have a semi-infinite uh, uh, slab of material that extends for all practical purposes to infinity, but has a very sharp edge, and you have a neutron or, reflection, a neutron or a x ray reflect from the surface. Well, the reflectivity is plotted on this scale, and here's this wave vector transfer. And you can see that up to some critical angle given by this relationship, 16 pi rho, up to that critical angle, the reflectivity is unity. 100%, every neutron, every photon in gets reflected back at that specular angle. Once you go past that critical edge, the scattering falls off as one over q to the fourth, just like Perot's scattering in the sands, small angle scattering. Okay, so this is, this is one, the, most, the simplest example you can imagine. But suppose that same sample has an edge that's not perfectly sharp, but is diffused or has a lot of structure in it. And again, we average over that in plane. And with that profile, instead of looking like this, we'll look like this, of some kind of shape. And as soon as that happens, then the reflectivity, you still have a critical angle, but the reflectivity falls off even faster than one over q to the fourth. So right away, if you have a surface and you want to know how rough it is, all you have to do is this measurement of the specular reflection as a function of q and see how fast the scattering falls off, and that tells you how rough it is. If it falls off as exactly one over to q to the four, it's perfectly sharp. If it falls off faster, as you model that and fit it, you'll find out just how wide that interfacial region is, how rough the surface is, okay? So already we have one tool in the box now that you can analyze surface roughness with. Now suppose that semi-infinite slab has another back edge to it, and it's actually a finite width. Well, waves being waves, you're going to get some kind of interference between that fraction of the scattering on the first surface and that from the back when it goes from the incident medium through the material and out the back into the back medium, and you'll get oscillations now that are called Kiesig fringes. And again, since we're dealing with this Fourier in general terms, this Fourier relationship between real and reciprocal space, there is a reciprocal relationship between length scales. So if this length, the thickness of that film is, let's say, d, then the oscillations are going to be reciprocally related to that in proportional to 1 over d. So by measuring just the positions of these minima, 2 pi over that will give you the thickness of the film. Okay, number two, you have number two tool that you can use to analyze the thickness of a film to exceedingly high accuracy. Okay. If things get even more complicated and I have some kind of depth profile, it oscillates as a function of depth. And in this picture, it's just drawn as triangular profiles. Then again, you'll get a series of sort of like diffraction peaks. They are diffraction peaks, in fact, that occur at, again, 2 pi over. So in Q, the positions of these peaks are 2 pi over the distance of that unit cell, the repeat distance in the real space. So again, this reciprocal relationship, okay? Okay, now what about accuracy? I mean, how much, where's, what's the information content? I said that, you know, in general terms, the real space uh, scattering length density is related to the Fourier transform of the reflection amplitude or vice versa, the inverse transform. So that means that transform is from minus infinity to infinity. So really, to know everything there is about a structure, you have to measure the scattering out to infinite Q. Well, we don't have machines that can do that because the reflection or reflectivity actually drops off as one 
as, as many orders of magnitude over a range of like one reciprocal angstrom. So how much information is lost by truncating the data? Suppose you collect the data up to this blue line to one reciprocal angstrom. Then if you look at this scattering length density profile here in the corresponding curve, you'll see that you get lots of detailed information to the scale of pi over one reciprocal angstrom or three, recipro or three angstroms. So that's your length scale. So if you measure out to this maximum Q, two pi, actually it turns out to be pi for other reasons we'll get into later. But roughly two pi over that wave vector transfer number that you can reach before you lose any all intensity in your instrument you have uh, a third of a nanometer resolution, okay? If you cut off here, you get correspondingly less information. You still get the general uh, idea of what the profile is, but a lot of the details are smeared out. And if you only measure to 0.3, it's even worse. But I guess, I think you get the idea there. The farther you measure in reciprocal or scattering space, the higher the Q you measure, the better your spatial resolution is in the models of the scattering profile that you're trying to model that scattering by. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions, just speak up, because I probably won't see you raise your hand. Just say, question, please, OK? And, and if, I, if, I'm, if you're getting hopelessly lost, please speak up so we can try to fix it, OK? Sorry, I should have said that at the beginning. OK, so you have a general idea of how the scattering can give us information about real space structures in reflectometry from thin film type systems. OK, so part two, let's look at some real examples for polymers, biomembranes, organic films, photovoltaic films. And in the next, in the next uh, talk uh, after the break, we'll concentrate on the hard condensed matter and the magnetic materials since we're going to be talking about polarized neutrons and one goes, one goes along with the other. OK, so uh, here's, a, here's a typical problem. And I've, I've had the great privilege to uh, be able, great good fortune to be able to work with lots of people in lots of different subject areas, biology, polymer science, and, and, and uh, physics over, over the years. And, there were some people at NIST, Susan Kruger and Ann Plant, who were really interested many years ago in studying how this per, a particular protein embedded itself in a, in a lipid bilayer. And the reason why this is important is all of our cells and all living animals, as I've learned, uh, are surrounded by very similar like lipid membranes that have head and tail groups oppositely opposed like this. And almost all of these are about 50 angstroms thick. That's the cell wall. So this defines the interior and exterior of a cell. And everything that interacts with the cell has to go via that barrier, through that membrane. So for example, we had that picture of that transmembrane protein, that alpha hemolysin that was shown way back in the early slides. But in this particular problem, they were interested in the particular protein uh, and how it embedded. It, it was called melatonin, and it's a component of bee venom. And it has lots of important implications in biology that I really can't tell you about because I don't know exactly how to tell you that. But they wanted to know whether that protein actually embeds itself in the cell membrane, penetrates it, gets through, or just bounces off. So the only way to see this, we're talking now about tens of angstroms, nanometer scales. The only way you can really get this, especially when you want to penetrate a surface and look beneath the surface, is to use neutron or X-ray reflection techniques. E electron microscopy is great for looking at the surface, at the top, what's there. But to see what's happening, how a particular biological macromolecule extends in to that surface, then you now have to look below where the light can't sit, where the uh, electrons or optical microscopies can't see. So this was kind of, at the time, this is a very challenging experiment. Why do I say that? Well, I've already told you that the film is only 50 angstroms thick, and you're going to put maybe with 10, 15, 20% density on top of this 
very thin film, this tiny little molecule, and try to see the difference of where that goes. And if you work out the typical area we look at is something like a square inch, it's less than a, cu a millionth of a cubic centimeter of material. And yet you can still get really detailed information from that. It's really astounding to me that this can happen. But again, it's because at low Q, the reflection of neutrons and x-rays is very, very strong. So again, taking advantage of the fact Neutrons can go through thick pieces of sample surrounding environments around the film. So here's your film. That would be the lipid bilayer with the melatonin in or not in it. You could put this on a perfect single crystal of silicon, and almost all of the neutrons can penetrate in and out of that. And that's nice because then you could take a reservoir, some fluid uh, reservoir of H2O, D2O, or whatever, in close contact direct contact with the film on the backside and study this as though that lipid bilayer was almost in its native environment. Okay, so doing that experiment, uh, because of this ability to go through the surrounding material, enables you to collect reflectivity data like this. So the blue and the black are two specular neutron reflectivity curves going out to a Q of 0.7. So remember, 0.7, that's really pretty good. That's like a half a nanometer resolution, five angstroms. And one of these curves, the black, is without melatonin. The second is after melatonin was added to that reservoir. And you can see, remember, this is a log plot. And the reflectivity is falling off by more than a factor of a million, seven orders of magnitude. Yet there's still really good signal all the way out to here. And you can see, it's a log plot, so it's hard to see here. There are big changes everywhere across the spectrum of that reflectivity curve. And if I plot that as multiply that by q to the fourth to normalize everything, you can see that there are substantial changes at several places in this before it starts to become, you start to run out of gas. So what that means is if you go and invert this data by using that transfer matrix solution method that we talked about at the beginning, you can see that the difference, this is not showing the substrate, but just the uh, uh, alkane thiol bond. There's a sulfur onto a gold surface here. Then there's an ethylene oxide part of the first part. Remember, the bilayer is two leaflets, head group, tail, tail, head group. One of those, the first one, was hydrogenated, which means that the scattering density is very, very low. And the second was deuterated, which means it's very, very high. And this is a, a legitimate tool that you can use to accentuate where you see what you want to see. So it turns out that with and without melatonin, there's a big difference, not so much in here, but in the top near the first head group. So they were able to deduce from this. And, and the thickness, this, this wasn't because I was careless and I just hand drew these profiles. But the thickness of the curves here is indicative of the uncertainty in that profile from the data, from the truncation of the set of data that we had here, and the fact that we cut it off at Q here, and the fact that there is statistical uncertainty in the, in the reflectivity points that were collected. But taking that into account, you can see that there's a big, big difference in the density profiles near the head group. And with the help of molecular dynamic simulations, it was determined that the melatonin pushes into the membrane. It doesn't sit on top. It actually gets in, but it doesn't go through the cell membrane. So that was a success uh, and, and a tour de force of studying a very small molecule in a very thin film. And now people have, again, this is, uh, these projects involve lots and lots of people. It's not one person doing this experiment. So in doing that experiment that we just talked about, the melatonin, about 10 people were involved in that, each with their own expertise, each contributing something to the problem. It involved molecular dynamic simulations, x-ray scattering, neutron scattering. And there were other uh, Raman spectroscopy done on the surface. A lot of tools to analyze that the coverage was complete, that the density of molecules in the surface was known, and so on. 
But also in all of this, it takes really talented biochemists who know how to make these lipid bilayer structures. This is not, again, a cell out of your body or out of the body of an animal or a plant. It's a single lipid bilayer system, a reductionist cell membrane that is just one type so that we can study one thing at a time, which is all we're capable of doing in any intelligent, systematic way. But for example, suppose now you wanted to study transmembrane proteins that stick all the way through this membrane layer, this bilayer here. And to get it off your solid support substrate, you have to suspend it above that. And so chemists, biochemists now, David van der Rod, NIST, have been able to make tethered links that allow the layer to float above so you get the fluid medium on both sides of the bilayer, and now it's possible to study things that actually extend through. So again, this is a tremendous lot of hard work by lots of people to be able to do this. You just don't take a sample and throw it on. Yes? So when you say read the technique profile system comes from this aggregate? Yes. That's, yes. So, so this structure, again, the idea is, that's a good question. The question was, because I'm supposed to repeat the questions, was do we get an ensemble average? And the answer is yes. What we're doing is we're averaging all of the scattering coming from this, side, from this plane at this depth, and then averaging across here and averaging across here all the way down in depth. So the, once you get that depth profile, so that if I plot down, the density gets bigger or smaller, bigger, then you have to go and infer from that density profile how the material in those layers was distributed. Okay? So that's where the molecular dynamics simulations comes in. We'll see more examples of that, okay? So here, uh, alrighty, we see more examples. So this is more recent work by, done by Frank Heinrich and Matthias Loesch and other people at NIST and other places. Uh, Doug McGillivray is from New Zealand, and Bulent is from Turkey. Hirsch is now at a pharmaceutical company in the United States. But these profiles for this particular system, this, uh, they studied uh, different types of pathogenic molecules and virus components that attack cells. And in this, I'm not going to go into any particular detail in, in this system, but Again, these structures, these complicated molecular structures, people first make use of all the information they know about that protein from, usually from X-ray crystallography, to know what its atomic makeup is. And then knowing that, try to find out how that, fold, that protein unfolds or distorts or whatever when it comes in contact with the surface. And again, the way to answer your question, this ensemble average, again, averaging across here, gives you these profiles. So you measure these reflectivity curves. Again, this is all normalized by multiplying by q to the fourth. But you look with this on and with it off, and then get the different profiles and how they change. And from that, you infer how that molecule, that you know something about its structure, how to sit on that surface to be consistent with that profile, OK? So I can, I, knowing this density, I can average across here, including the space in between the molecules, and get a profile and then work out what this orientation, if this thing were lying flat, this profile would look completely different, okay? Does that kind of answer your question? Okay, here are some other things. And it's important, for example, in this system, uh, again, if you look in a biology textbook or a bio, microbiology textbook or biochemistry book, all of these pictures, these so-called cartoon drawings, all of this is, comes, the ability to draw these pictures comes from analyzing these depth profiles and knowing something about the structure from protein crystallography and from doing molecular dynamic simulation. So putting all of that together, if this is consistent with the molecule sitting in this orientation and not sticking out twice as far or lying down flat on the surface. But this is the only way to know this, by combining all of these techniques. OK, and here's some more uh, profiles. Again, these profiles, remember in the way to back, I said, well, you take like a slice of bread and divide everything into thin slices. 
Well, you could be a little bit more sophisticated than that, and instead of using just rectangular bins, you can take Gaussian distributions or normal distributions of the molecules in that bilayer and you know, have really tiny, microscopic, very small, few angstrom-sized bins that correspond to these overall distributions. So that's all part of the modeling. Uh, just for another example, here's a system that was worked on by Ursula Therese Salas. She's now at the University of Southern Illinois. Uh, and she worked with uh, a couple of people from Emory Medical School. Elliot Chaikoff is a vascular surgeon. And they were trying to develop uh, artificial veins and arteries. So if you have uh, a vein replaced in, for a clogged artery or something like this, or I'm sorry, an artery placed where it was clogged, uh, instead of taking something from another part of your body and using it, they wanted to develop an artificial thing that was biocompatible. And so to make a long story short, part of their study involved a structure that consisted of some polyelectrolyte multilayer uh, section and a phospholipid terpolymer section on top. And this was the constituent, the cross section of what this material that would be used as the, as the vein or artery would be. And they wanted to know when it came in contact with a fluid medium, blood for example, where does the blood go? Where does it get into this? And, and most of blood is water anyway. So what they did is this experiment with water. And they did a reflectometry experiment with this system, these layered structure in contact with the reservoir, and got a bunch of typical reflectivity data. And by changing the water from H2O to D2O and getting several sets of data, they were able to deduce, to work out, that the water fraction profile, again, is a function of depth into the layer. Most of the water resided in the polyelectrolyte layer. It sort of just went right through the turf polymer phospholipid on the top, and it just concentrated in that polyelectrolyte layer. Again, there's no way to determine this any other way. You can't see water distributions with a microscope. OK, optical microscope or with electron microscopy. You have to use molecular dynamics simulations. You have to do reflection with x-rays and neutrons to get this depth profile beneath the surface. OK, so uh, let's, this is just of general interest. And we'll probably just spend a few minutes on this uh, about the uh, phase problem, but we'll, then we'll use an example to illustrate how this is important. OK, so it turns out that here's a reflectivity profile. And this was done on a titanium, titanium oxide film. So here is titanium layer. It has a negative scattering length density, by the way, for neutrons. And then there's an oxide layer on top. So on our left is a silicon substrate. Then there's a thin, you know, maybe 60 angstrom thick layer of tit pure titanium. And then there's a titanium oxide layer. And for electrochemistry, for battery research, it's important to know in an operating cell, electric cell, uh, electrochemical cell, how things, what happens to these layers when you apply the electrical potential. Well, anyway. Just to illustrate here, here's a reflectivity profile for this system. And this family of curves are repeated fits to this data. So again, we have statistical noise. We have truncation of the data. We have to fit this with that mathematical uh, model, the solution of the Schrodinger equation, to the measured data to get out the profile. And you get fits that have some uncertainty associated with it. And the distribution of these curves is a reflection of the uncertainty to profile. So you can see the general shape looks like this, but every fit gives you a slightly different curve, and so on and so forth. OK, that's still pretty good. You know where the oxidized part is in that electrochemical cell. And it as it turns out, if you look at this paper, this changes as a function of applied voltage. But anyway, to get that information out, you got to fit that data. And there's the result. OK, if you keep working on it, and you try to get a better and better fit, sometimes something very bad happens. Instead of this family of curves that look like this, you get ones that look completely different, a whole other set of curves that fit with equally good probability. What the heck is going on there? 
Well, it turns out only one, I've only shown one representative curve from each family, but you can see that they're actually symmetry related. And there is no way doing reflection or diffraction experiment on one set of data that you can distinguish the two in principle. And that's because of this phase problem. When we take the reflectivity, it's the reflected intensity divided by the instant intensity. And all of the phase information about the relative positions of the scattering material, all the material that's scattering scatters, but you now lose the idea of where the scattering material actually lies relative to other pieces of it. So when you square this, it becomes a game of trial and error, basically fitting the data and then trying to deduce with other information which one of these families of curves actually corresponds to the real situation. And in this particular case, nothing has a scattering density in the system that high, and you can rule this one out, and you know that this is the correct answer. But in other cases, a priori, you don't know that. So it turns out that in holography or interferometry, there are ways of determining not the wave function squared, but the wave function amplitude. And you can do this by a technique of using references. So you can, in holography, you create a three-dimensional image from an object by scattering light or transmitting light through an object and referencing a similar beam of light through a standard reference material that you know. So the idea is this. If you can do that, it's possible to get uh, a solution uh, this way. So you can take, let's say this red block, very crude idea here, is just the system that you're interested in. Well, you could place next to it a blue reference, a green reference, and a purple reference, and you can measure three reflectivity profiles for this composite system. And if you know these references, the blue, the green, and the red profiles, they're known materials that you put there, then you could back out, in fact, the unknown profile for the thing that you're interested in. And it turns out that this is exactly possible. And here's the algebra that shows you that if you do that and you solve the set of algebraic equations for the three composite systems, you can get out the part of the potential reflection amplitude now not the wave function squared for the part you're interested in. And then these Russian theoreticians back in the 50s figured out a way that once you know that, even in the dynamical situation that we have where we have to solve the Schrodinger equation, there is, instead of the Fourier transform, there's an uh, integral equation transform that relates the scattering density to the uh, measured composite reflection amplitude or the reflection amplitude derived from the composite system. So knowing this mathematics and the ability to do those reference measurements, here's an example that where it works for two references. These are two reflectivity curves with two different, so there's an unknown system, uh, let's say this lipid bilayer system here, that is alternate, alternately placed next to an aqueous reservoir, or, or in this case, it was a substrate, I believe, a silicon and then saf sapphire. Two sets of reflectivity data were, were collected, and then from that, mathematically uh, solved to give you the reflection amplitude that corresponds only to the unknown system. And here is the result, the red curve, and it has oscillations due to the truncation at a finite Q, finite wave vector transfer. But it gives you a very good, accurate uh, agreement to the molecular dynamics simulation for that. So this solution is interesting because it's exact. This is, can be proven to be a unique solution. There are no other alternatives. You don't have two symmetry-related choices to make. There are no adjustable parameters, no, nothing to do. Just solve these equations, and you get the profile to within what's allowed by the statistical error in the truncation. So the point here is just so that you know, if you do this kind of measurement by substitution of reservoirs or different constituents in the sample in a known and controlled way with a reference structure, 
you can, in fact, do imaging. This picture is just as good as a real space picture. It's the only possible thing that there can be. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. And it's possible with this to work out very accurately what the uncertainties in the profiles are given a certain truncation and uncertainty in your data. Okay, the last five minutes we have in this session, I'll just go through one more example that makes use of this type of uh, uh, phase determination. So here is uh, the P a group of people from the, from the University of Delaware in the chemical engineering department working on uh, organic solar cells. Uh, and the solar cell is made up of these two chemical constituents, which I am not going to even try to pronounce. But they're, one of them is a familiar, has a familiar buckyball carbon C60 group on it. And these two components are mixed together in this organic layer. And it turns out that when light is incident, electrons are created, excitons uh, are, are produced, that conduct current across and produce a cell, an electrical cell. But as it turns out, it's very important to know how these two components are separated so that the, you get the maximum production of the electrons, okay, and you get the maximum current. And it turns out because these so-called excitons, the electron charge carriers, have a given, have a diffusion length that's only 100 angstroms, then it's really important how you place these two chemical constituents. So this is a perfect example for neutron reflectometry. You have two organic materials that are mixed together that if you look at one material with your eye and the other, they look the same. Right? But if you hydrogenate one and deuterate the other, then they look as different as night and day for neutrons. So the idea was to deuterate one of those components, hydrogenate the other, and do a neutron reflectometry specular measurement, get this depth profile. Now, the ideal structure, it turns out, given that diffusion length constraint, is something that looks like a comb-like structure, so that these are pill so you coat one side and have pillars extended into the other material that is coated on or that resides on the top. So it's, you want to you want to do something like this, okay? And the question is, what is the actual morphology when you try to make it? Do the chemicals actually rearrange themselves lamellar-like, like this, like a dye block copolymer does, or what do you get? So if you do the reflection measurement, specular reflection, uh, you can do it with air on the top or cover it with water. So that's the same as having two reference materials, D2O and air. You make two composite reflectivity measurements, okay? And from that reflectivity data, you can deduce the real part of the scattering amplitude, not the wave function squared, but again, the, wave, the 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 amplitude that corresponds just to the layer itself that you're interested in. It. And if you invert that, you get this profile. And you can do it two ways. You can solve that gelfand levitin marchenko integral equation. Or you can just take the two sets of data and simultaneously fit it. All the information is there in those two composite reflectivity data sets. It doesn't matter how you get to it. So you solve that. And this was done both ways by simultaneous fit, where you could constrain some parts of it to be flat because you know that they are within uh, some interior section, if you like, in the model, or just do a completely free form inversion, and they're in extremely good agreement. But what do you notice? Whereas you are trying to get one of the chemical constituents to, con to, to concentrate at this interface and the other at the other interface, it turns out they kind of both go to the interfaces. One of the constituents goes to both interfaces. And so it turns out this isn't a really good morphology for the system. Okay, it's a bad answer, but it's the, it is the answer. It is what it is. But this is the only way you could determine this. And so you can see from this profile that instead of having a comb-like interlocking structure, uh, interstitial structure, you get this uh, uh, concentration at both interfaces. Okay, not just some details. Now, last two minutes, 
So all of this is all well and fine, and you may never look at this stuff again. But if you have a reflectometry problem to work on, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and do all this. All of these programs have been uh, for fitting and, and working on the data, interpreting the data, are available. For instance, you could go to the NIST website uh, and click on reflectometry and get some information uh, about, you know, background information, different references. But there's also a section on data analysis that has, for example, remember we say we have to average across this layer. Well, you can build the model in your head, whatever you think it is that your system looks like, and plug it in here and get a calculation. Use that to help you calculate that scattering length density profile. And then you could go to these really nice programs that were developed by Brian Ranville and Paul Kinsel at NIST. And you could sit there online and adjust your profile, move things up and down, and see simultaneously your reflection profile change. So this is another great thing about doing these kinds of reflection problems. You can have a system in mind, and you can make up your tentative, your model scattering length density profile, and then see how sensitive the reflectometry is to the features in that profile model that you made, how sensitive do you are to those features. So you can determine whether it's realistic to do an experiment before you spend umpteen hours in the lab trying to make a sample. You can find out, can I see, for example, if I want to see where this particular uh, constituent, this particular group of molecules sits in this layer, I can go make a model and calculate the exact reflectivity you would get for that model and know, is this happening at a level of 10 to the minus 3, minus 4 in reflectivity that we can actually measure today? Or is it happening out here where the reflectivity is 10 to the minus 9 and it's hopeless? Okay, so you can answer those questions and you could use these online calculators to do that. And there's also uh, a nice uh, publication that came out that helps you once you find out, oh, this is potentially <coughs> excuse me, possible to do, there is a way that you can go and actually, when you get the experimental data, actually fit it with these really good programs that exist. Okay, any other questions? And I think we can stop here. Okay.